Let us pray. O God, source and ground of all being, O love who move the sun and the other stars, O merciful and compassionate, be present with your blessing as we honor these men and women who have heard the call to work for the health and well-being of their fellow human beings. As this great university has taught all her children always to be grateful for who they are, grant that they may always be true to themselves and their convictions, always with humility and an open spirit, that they may continue to learn, to grow, to develop, and so to be a blessing to their patients, to their teachers, their families, and to all the world. We ask this of you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. This is my first graduation, and I was told it was going to be awesome, but nobody told me it was going to be this awesome. This is a truly magnificent view from up here. I wish everybody could actually just turn around and see it. This is a very special event and a very special day. So welcome to the 40th commencement exercises of the Warren Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University. I want to start out by thanking a number of people. First, I want to start out by thanking the families of the loved ones and the loved ones of our graduates. Your graduate could not be where they are without what you've done. Congratulations on getting them to the threshold of a great career, and congratulations yourselves for doing what it took to get them there. Let me also congratulate the faculty and staff that are here. Their advice, their guidance, their mentorship, has played a major role in getting the sea of mortar boards that you now see in front of you ready to get to this momentous event. Whoops. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so uh, uh, to the faculty and staff, look around. This is your legacy. And the legacy that you're sending out today will continue to do th good things for years and years to come. Let me also acknowledge and thank three former deans that are in attendance today. Dean Stanley Aronson. <laughs> Dean Greer. And Dean Besden, thank you for coming today. <laughs> to the class of 2014, it goes without saying that we are immensely proud of you and proud of what you've accomplished. You have done wonderful things. You have done wonderful things academically. And from the video that I saw at your match day, you've played hard very well as well. You clearly have captured all the, all the aspects of what it's like to be the wonderful people that you are. Uh, and we're very, very, very proud of you. You've got immense knowledge, immense compassion, and we're thrilled that you're at this very important time uh, in your careers. You're gonna soon walk out the door and you're gonna be charged with very serious things. You're going to be asked to take care of the sick. You're gonna be asked to minister to the less fortunate. You're gonna have people coming to you for advice and telling you all the intimate secrets of their lives. These are big challenges. These are big responsibilities. I urge you to take these responsibilities seriously and never waver from your commitment to improving the lives of your patients and the society and culture that they come from. As always, you clearly need to listen to your patients. They have a great story to tell you. 
Now, every commencement speaker wants to go down off the podium having made a number of, of takeaway points, and I am uh, no different. So there are three points that I want to make today for the graduates, their loved ones, and everybody here. The first is remember where you came from and how you got there and who helped you get there. Uh, on days like this, I flash back to my own graduation from medical school. Like all of the graduates today, I was very excited. My parents were very excited. But probably the most excited person in the room was my grandmother. My grandmother had grown up in northern Greece. She grew up in a place where women didn't go to school. She had had no education. She grew up at a time when war was imminent. She grew up at a time when the economics were horrible. And she knew she had to do something. She found herself a single mother with two young uh, children uh, and no way of supporting them. She took my father and my uncle. She went down to the port city of Patras in Greece, convinced a trap steamer, steamer uh, to take them to Ellis Island, uh, and off they came to Ellis Island. In Ellis Island, my grandmother looked at my uh, father and realized he had developed a rash on steerage ride across on the boat. And at that point in time, when you got to Ellis Island, if you had anything that even remotely looked like an infectious disease, they put you on the boat and they sent you right back. So my grandmother took my uncle, got, sent him for two physical exams, gave one set of papers to my father, walked him out the door at Ellis Island and came out into the United States. <laughs> when I came off the podium, the first person I saw was my grandmother. I put my mortar board on her head, I gave her a big hug, and she looked at me and she said, you may be a doctor, but I'm a professor. <laughs> I'm a professor of life. And she was right. Had my grandmother not done what she had done and had the wits about her to get us to the United States, the whole history of the family, my personal history, would be very, very different. So my message to you graduates is to remember the people around you who care about you, who do great things for you. You need to thank them every day for what they do and you also need to pay back their kindness by passing it forward, doing the same thing for your loved ones, doing the same thing for your patients, doing the same things for everything, every people, everybody that you meet. The second point I wanna make is to remember that this is not the end, this is the beginning. You've been through four arduous years of learning, but you have an immense more challenging time to come. You're about to enter a treadmill of new knowledge. You're about to experience things that you've gotten glimpses of, but you've never done them quite the way you're gonna do them in the next couple of years. You've gotta take the next couple of years to find your passion. All of medical school, all of your internship, all of your residency is about finding your passion. You've got to get to a point where when you wake up in the morning and you come downstairs and you're about to walk out the door and you say, for the next 8, 10, 12 hours, this is what I'm going to do. Whatever X is, it better put a smile on your face. And if it puts a smile on your face, you found the right place for yourself, you found your right niche in society, and you've used your medical school time your residency time and all your training uh, appropriately. The last message I want to make uh, is one where I think uh, to me is a very important one as well, and that is I think it's incumbent on you to improve medicine. I would strongly suggest that it's the obligation of every graduate to do something during the course of their career that improves medicine, improves the care we provide in one manner or another. Uh, I told you the little story about my grandmother and graduations. Let me tell you a different story. There was a patient that I had as an intern named Nick D'Alessandroni. Nick D'Alessandroni had a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. He was admitted to the hospital with what we now think of as an exacerbation of IPF. And he looked at me and said, do you have any treatment for me? I smiled at him, told him we would do the best that we could, and we did what we did at the time, which in retrospect we now know was nothing at all, even though medicine was involved, uh, and eventually Nick died a very difficult death. I took Nick's death hard as an intern, 
And I committed myself at that point in time to spend a good bit of the rest of my career trying to understand idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and trying to come up with new therapies for this disease. So you can imagine last week when at the American Thoracic Society meeting, for the first time ever, two new drugs were announced that both prolonged the lives of people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Myself, everybody who's worked in this area, had a bit of a tear in their eye because we now do have a new treatment that we did not have before. When I first came to Brown, many people asked me, what are the take home messages you wanna leave for the students? What are the things you want them to carry out the door? Well, I would tell you that I think we owe the best that we possibly can for our patients. We owe the best and most efficient care we can for society. But I think we also owe it to future caregivers and future pa patients to get to a place where we have treatments, and yes, I'll even say it, maybe even can prevent or cure diseases in the future that we can't cure or prevent now. And so how would that happen? How is that going to uh, take place? Well, I am challenging this class, and I will challenge every class at Brown during my tenure here, that it is uh, your responsibility to improve one aspect of the delivery of care for at least one disease during the course of your time as a physician. How you do that will depend on your passion. It can be done in a research lab, it can be done in the clinic, it can be done in the operating room, it can be done at a computer terminal, it can be done at a remote clinic in some third world country, but take it upon yourself to make a difference in one area, in one disease, and then imagine if every student from Brown did that, and then every medical student did that, where would we be 10 years from now? Where would we be 20 years from now? So, in closing, let me congratulate the graduates. Wonderful, wonderful day. Enjoy this day, smell the roses. It's a, it's a very special event. To the families, another wonderful thing. It's a, it's a very, very special event. To the loved ones, the professors, the staff, this is truly, truly, one of the high points that one can have in academics and in, in one's personal life. But my last message to the graduates is to remember that wherever your life's journey takes you, you'll always be a member of the Brown family, you'll always be part of the Alpert Medical School community, and we will always be there for you. Go out, enjoy, have a good time. It's my great pleasure to be here today to introduce my friend, my mentor, and as of today, my colleague, Dr. Edward Feller. My medical education has taught me to question everything, look for an alternate explanation, another diagnosis, don't take anything at face value, don't believe that anything is as simple, as good, or as bad as it seems. This is a good concept, and it applies to practically everything, with the exception of Dr. Feller. <laughs> For years before I met him, I heard his name constantly. I would ask my friends who were upperclassmen, what's so great about this guy anyway? And they would tell me everything, everything is great about him. And it's true, they were right. He really is as good as everyone says he is, and it really is as simple as that. 12 years ago, Dr. Feller left a thriving private practice and his post of, as chief of gastroenterology at the Miriam Hospital to teach full time. Since then, he's devoted all of his time and energy, days and nights, weekdays and weekends, to, to teaching students. He works over 100 hours a week for a salary of about $10,000, which commutes, computes to less than $2 an hour. Only Dr. Feller would refer to this as an easy decision. <laughs> Since then, Dr. Feller has co-authored 226 papers with medical students and started many more on the research that will become the basis of their future careers. The most important thing Dr. Feller does for medical students is believe in them. He has a reputation for being a dream maker, and he did it for me. As an undergraduate at Cornell, I started research in pornography, and I had a terrible time finding mentors. 
I went to professor after professor who said, this is a great concept. I'm so glad someone's doing it, but I can't have my name associated with this. <laughs> When I sought to resume the research here at Brown, I went through the same experience again with one crucial difference that this time Dr. Feller agreed to mentor me himself. He confessed to me that he spent the next few years in a constant state of panic that someone was going to stop him while he was running or at the grocery store and ask him what kind of business he had researching sex anyway. <laughs> But he overcame his embarrassment and he risked his reputation to build mine because that's the kind of guy he is. The pornography research that no one except for Dr. Feller believed in under his expert guidance led to national and international presentations in San Francisco and Peru and to two invitations to give hospital-wide grand rounds. Dr. Feller presented grand rounds with me earlier this year, just six weeks after the tragic, premature death of his much beloved wife, Wendy. In addition to being a dream maker, Dr. Feller is someone who stands by his word regardless of circumstances and who never lets students down, who endlessly puts the needs of others above his own. One of the saddest things about leaving Brown for me will be leaving Dr. Feller. It's with the greatest sense of gratitude and admiration that I now invite my mentor, my friend, and one of the best people I know to the stage to address you. Please welcome Dr. Feller. So first of all, to the class of 2014 and 2015, here in this church, I'm sitting next to Alex Morang, and you're not. <laughs> um, Dean Elias, colleagues, families, beloved students. Um, I should explain the pornography, but I'm still experiencing some performance anxiety. Um, um, that wasn't a joke. <laughs> um, so my subject is connections, the sacred space of shared experience or an abyss, an impassable chasm that separates us. So connections matter to us and our patients. My internship, first day, a newly arrived first admission. A 32-year-old woman admitted with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia. She liked being called Violet. She rarely had hospital visits. This was Montreal in July. No air, no air conditioning, steaming, an isolation room, um, repetitive gowning, gloving, uh, hat, enormous non-breathable mask with uh, eye goggles, um, I spent endless hours uh, with Violet in that room. Chemotherapy, blood draws, transfusions, and uh, it, it is the memory of my first month uh, of internship. The oppressiveness of the stifling garb stayed with me. Um, I would wear the same heavy battle gear almost 10 years ago when uh, my wife, Wendy, was diagnosed with the same disease as Violet, acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, in the early days, she whispered to me, um, will you stay with me if I'm scared at the end? Then we cried, and after a decade of hospitalizations, uncounted uh, infusions, clinical trials, and horrid diffuse graft-versus-host disease, which uh, killed her, so few months ago. Um, but back to Violet. My ward month ended off to a different hospital. Violet was discharged two days later. Two months passed, a phone call. Violet is in the hospital, marrow full of blasts. Decades later, I would shudder hearing the boom and destruction of blasts. My wife's first course of uh, chemotherapy had failed. She had genetically unfavorable leukemia, if leukemia is not bad enough, so that we were scared. 
I greeted Violet warmly after not seeing her for months. She was uncertain, tentative. She didn't remember me. I had been her closest contact with the world for, for months. I said, it, it's Dr. Feller, it's Dr. Feller. Oh, Dr. Feller, I've never seen your face. It's a nice face. And so that, that really has a message which I had not clued into as I should have. Why should she recognize me? She had seen me masked and gowned in July. She could cue into my communications of um, a hushed voice, a look, a hesitation, a shift in the body. And patients see us, their doctors, like this. Is it bad? Is it really bad? Hidden behind the pajamas or Johnny is someone like Violet. I hope I held her hand, but I doubt it. After a while, an uncomfortable goodbye, my empty and stupid good luck. Good luck. Um, not I'm so sorry that you are dying. You are a nice woman. I like you as a patient and a person. Violet's disease would kill her within days. I'll visit soon. Um, I was clueless. Then the dreaded, thank you, Dr. Feller. But I had done so very little. I wasn't smart enough or kind enough at that time to understand. But that comes later, as our graduates will discover. I went home to a lovely wife and a six-month-old son, somewhere there, um, who would re later receive his MD degree in this room. Um, I didn't visit Violet over the weekend, too busy with my life. On Monday, her room was empty, um, her bed neatly made. There was no indentation even in the bed to mark her presence there. Violet was dead, and I didn't really understand that I had deserted her, which I had. Um, I heard kind remarks after Wendy's funeral. I can't imagine what you are feeling. Also said to returning war veterans, grieving mothers, or to a friend who failed an exam. But so many of us here, you, the unknown person who's sitting next to you, have experienced horrors, terror, grief. Perhaps not the horror of war or the loss of a, of a loved one, but we all live and life does smack us a lot. So Violet is you or me, uh, us. The problem with grief is that it becomes incommunicable when we fetishize it, as it's been said about returning war veterans. But I think I believe, and you have to believe, I do have the tools to start to understand your loss, your grief. If not, the sacred space of connections becomes an impassable abyss. There is no entrance for others as there is no exit. Feel your patients' lives. It, it takes time and I learned it painfully, but I think I learned it well. Always one disgruntled student. Um, I think I know who that is also. Um, it was September 2004 when Wendy got sick. The CBC was horrifying. I remember clearly I was, in, I was having lunch with a medical student, just a beautiful day, and I got a phone call. So I got Wendy, we cried, and jumped into the void. Will you be there if I'm scared at the end, she said again. Um, I want to say that the blurb for my talk is sanitized. Um, I graduated the only school I was accepted to, the University of Pennsylvania, with a 2.2 grade point average, rejected from thousands of US medical schools. <laughs> Dear Mr. Edward Feller, we are sending you two rejection letters. The second is if you decide to apply next year. <laughs> um, 
I, I wanted to say that, that I put a few jokes in here as speed bumps. I, I'm not certain that I will be able to hold myself together, so I thought the, the speed bumps would slow me down a little bit. I went to medical school in Dijon, France with a bit of high school French. After two years, Wendy and I got married, flew to Paris, and then uh, drove to uh, Dijon. Um, we got there, and the first thing I learned was that married two days, I had flunked a year of medical school and had to repeat the entire year. Um, so Wendy and I sort of sealed together. You have to trust each other, and you have to grow together, and you have to sort of know, I won't back off, and I know you won't either. We endured. Wendy, later a stage actor by profession, supported us by singing in cafes and small nightclubs as I listened, studying with a flashlight. It was the best of times in many ways. Um, Recently, I was invited to dinner by young medical student mentees and friends, the ladies three, Mama, Zajana, and Jaga. Why don't they have real names? I mean, I don't know why. But I love the evening, and my point is that, I mean, I live alone with you know, noises and memories, and dinner with wonderful students, friends, was a joy. Thanks for adopting me, I wrote in an email, which was apt and an honest reply. In reply, I got protestations. No, it is we who owe you a lot. It was an honor. Excuse me, students, but many don't understand something that is true for the people you know, and you can easily name them. We, your mentors, receive as much from you as you receive from us. You take a bulk and volume and space in our lives as, as we should in yours. Other than marrying my lifelong love, the, the best decision in my life, as um, Lisa mentioned, was really just to take a leap of faith and say, if I don't teach full time and I die, I will have missed something. So. Um, being able to interact and collaborate with medical students full-time is, is a blessing, the magnitude of which I had not dared to dream. And um, you, should, you should know that because there are a lot of us. So know this. Seek out the best doctors and mentors and become these people. As Wendy slowly died in late November, her last words to me were, I've loved you for so long. May you find this in your lives. The last breath never came. My daughter and I held her hands at home. I shut off her special bed's generator. The bed no longer shook. When Wendy had once moved, she was still and silent. After she was taken away, I saw indentation in the sheets where her body moved no more. Um, is there a lesson here? Um, I have become more empathic towards everyone. People who have suffered or not, our patients, those who've had grievous losses, or those who live their lives, because just like we really don't understand more than a few people, and my description of Violet is my immature view of her. The image of my wife is more fleshed out, but everyone is more fleshed out when you know them. Um, this is also the message of Violet's life. Um, it was unexplored to me when I believe I failed her. One good doctor, one good intern would have been magical for her. Um, I should stop. There is a minor tradition in um, commencement speeches which has arisen. So final advice. This is to parents. 
I want you to know that the last teaching your children will receive before they receive their MD degrees, it is very important to have a lot of sex. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing Joseph Tofti, our class commencement speaker, and also one of my closest friends in medical school. To eliminate any ambiguity, let me start off by saying that he is not your average Joe. <laughs> Far from it. Hailing from a modest town in Minnesota, Joe arrived in the Northeast to our modest sister institution, also known as Harvard College, before moseying his way down to Brown for medical school. Along with an appreciation for all things Midwestern, this non-Joe Schmo brought with him no lack of interests and passions. A true modern-day Renaissance man, Joe is our resident expert in singing, playing multiple musical instruments, camping, car maintenance, rock climbing, whistling, and all things avian tech. But of course, I cannot forget to mention his love for skiing and running, the two activities that have given him a reputation here for always being on the move. Quite literally, he has run two and a half marathons in the last four years and cross-country skied over 50 miles in 2014 alone. Despite this apparent inability to sit still, Joe has still managed to find time to be very involved in the life and fast times at Alpert Medical School. In fact, he has been a critical part of our medical school productions, mostly working magic from behind the scenes. Joe assisted with AV and technology in our everyday classroom lectures, co-produced the very first and since subsequent low yield variety show, and served as a cinematographer, editor, and executive producer for all of our class videos, including those you saw last night. Today, Joe is stepping out from behind the screens, shedding his usual Patagonia attire, for academic regalia, ready to impart to us his simultaneously sage and silly advice. Please join me in welcoming Alpert Medical School's own one-man band, our very own Joseph Tofti. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, hello again, everyone. Welcome to graduation. Um, I'm really not sure. I'm still puzzled as to why MD14 thought it would be a good idea to give me both an audience, a microphone, and 15 minutes of your time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm incredibly honored to have the opportunity to share my thoughts and reflections um, on the last four years. Uh, first of all, heartfelt congratulations to everyone I, I know that I can say that there were at least several times that I doubted I would make it here today, and I'm sure you can all relate. If the content of this speech seems unfamiliar, you'd better make sure you didn't accidentally attend RISD for the last four years. <laughs> um, I think it would be remiss to talk about graduation and success without first going through a short list of people in our lives for whom we feel incredibly grateful. Thank you to the first patient upon whom I unloaded a full 48-point review of systems. <laughs> this interview briefly peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 list of most humiliating patient encounters of 2011. <laughs> for those of you unfamiliar with the review of systems, an inquiry of that magnitude screens for every, essentially every disease in human history, including some that have been eradicated. <laughs> Thank you to my unyieldingly patient preceptor whose feedback was maybe you could focus a little more on the pertinent review of systems next time. He was truly a maestro of understatement. <laughs> Speaking of feedback, thanks to the resident who wrote, Joe is always professional and well-groomed. 
do you know what else tend to be well-groomed and professional? Horses. <laughs> Thank you to our brave internal medicine chief who repeatedly allowed us to impale her radial artery while attempting our first arterial blood gas draws. Based upon the sheer magnitude of exquisite pain this procedure is known to cause, I think it's safe to say that some people will do literally anything for a teaching award. <laughs> Thank you to Lori Avalon for facilitating the 11th hour weekend before cancellation of numerous clinical electives that I completely forgot I scheduled. <laughs> Thanks to the female patient in the emergency room who believed me when I told her I'd sewed up 12 facial lacerations prior to hers. And by 12, I mean that I had watched a resident suture one once. <laughs> um, Donna Ruda for putting on amazing events, including this one. And of course, Brown's incredible, incredible faculty, staff, significant others, siblings, parents, family, and all the rest. Because these people, all of these people here, have taken falls for us along the way. They sent us home early from night float. They whispered closed triangle under their breath in the operating room and made us look good on rounds. They listened to us complain over the phone, even when they didn't totally understand what it was we were complaining about. Tertiary exams, for example. They double-checked our rank lists and opened our step one score reports, paid our cell phone bills, processed our paperwork, and guided us incessantly forward toward a future that they positively believed we could substantiate, even when we didn't. Now, a little about the title of this speech. When I say work in progress, what I really mean is this ongoing cycle we've experienced again and again. It really comes in three phases. It begins with the uncertainty of the new, the self-doubt and the questioning. Then, it's the meandering journey of growth, both personal and professional, and finally, it's the tenuous vacuum of transition, the launching point for the next cycle. I want to spend some time on each of these phases and get a sense for where we've been and where we're going. The cycle begins with uncertainty. Fourth year has been a strange contrast to the torrential workload of the first three years. To say that I've had more free time would be an enormous understatement. I slept on my couch for four days in a sleeping bag, because I lacked the constitution to take my bedding out of the dryer. <laughs> I nearly developed a pressure ulcer from watching consecutive seasons of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I've called up old friends and reminded them that I exist, begged them to continue to remember that I exist while I disappear for five more years during residency. I've awakened some mornings blissful with the knowledge that there is absolutely nothing, nothing that I have to do today. But, along with the newfound peace of these empty hours, I find myself thinking more about that nebulous rain cloud of thought involving the future that I've rarely dwelled upon as I've rushed through these last years as an, at an incredible pace. It feels alarmingly similar to the kind of feelings, the uncertainty, I know we've shared at major turning points along the way. The summer before med school started, board exams, starting rotations on the wards, applications and interviews and so on. And those same familiar questions have started to echo again. How will I find the time? What if I don't succeed? Is this what I want? And do I love what I'm becoming? It's strange because I really didn't expect the new confidence that comes with the accomplishment of graduation to bring these new doubts and insecurities. Let me share a story with you. During our endocrine block of first year, I got back late from the library, backpack loaded down with reams and reams of lecture notes. Do you guys remember those? <laughs> They're all iPads now. There, there was this fourth year student crashing on our couch for graduation, getting ready to go out and do fourth year things with some of his fourth year buddies. He eyed my heavy bag and my stressed body language and smiled and got this far off look in his eyes. Listen, man, he told me. I don't know how to say this to you so you'll believe me, but it's all going to work out. I promise you, it will. Don't stress too hard over this block. I know this sounds crazy, but you're going to look back, and it's all going to seem totally insignificant. I immediately felt this intense feeling of relief. I spent the night eating ramen and playing guitar and catching up with old, old friends. Please. I looked at him like he had a third eye. What do you mean it's going to be okay? 
Don't you know that the honors cutoff is 90%? There's only one exam this block. How in the world is anyone going to take me seriously if I don't under endocrine? For crying out loud, is the pituitary gland. Have you heard? It's kind of important. <laughs> in this cycle of uncertainty, growth, and transition, a little self-awareness goes a long way. Listen to your mentors, your seniors, and your advisors. They know you better sometimes than you know yourself. When they say it's going to work out, believe them. And of course, if they tell you you're screwed, you should probably pay attention too. <laughs> the middle phase of the cycle is growth. And I mean that as both professional and human growth. I went back and spent some time exhuming and poring over my doctoring reflections. If you're feeling nostalgic, don't break the seal. Leave them in the past. They should be incinerated along with your diary entries from fifth grade. For the uninitiated, doctoring reflections were writing assignments we did back in years one and two that encouraged us to examine themes involving the doctor-patient relationship, what it means to be a professional, and how to cope with and reflect on our feelings and emotions. The truth is, back then, not only was I an actual hazard to patient well-being, but it turns out I was also quite poorly informed. Some of you might argue that this has only been marginally tempered by time. <laughs> I'd like to correct some of my misconceptions of the past. Patient care isn't routinely glamorous or even necessarily exciting, let alone exhilarating. Physicians aren't godlike tomes of knowledge with analytical brains wielding tools of diagnostic certainty. And medicine, as an institution, only occasionally seems to live up to its self-described higher purpose of curing, curing illness while preserving dignity. It's not that I'm disillusioned, but maybe I was a bit idealistic. I know I spent a lot of time early on in medical school selling myself the notion that all of these experiences in class and in clinic would serve to transform me into something really different, that I would somehow become desensitized to pain and poverty and suffering and that I'd be able to wield this tool, this professionalism, with superhuman impunity to right wrongs and heal the sick. But somehow, even after everything that's happened, I still just feel profoundly human, and I sometimes wonder if I've grown or changed at all. I'm young, fallible, and scared, opinionated, prone to self-doubt, and worse, gratuitous self-critique. When I think about this, I hardly feel professional at heart, even by my own standards. But it's this very struggle that makes medicine so wonderfully challenging and even often satisfying. You see, I'm reassured by the fact that the layperson to professional transition doesn't have a definite endpoint. Becoming a doctor really is an ongoing process. Or in more cynical terms, your degree is worthless. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> It's a slow transformation that grows and changes as you do and as the healthcare system does. We have to work every day to transcend the human tendencies of bias, judgment, and aversion in order to bring compassion to those without love, care to those who cannot care for themselves, and dignity to those who have none. But surely, you say, we must have changed somehow. Well, don't get me wrong. My capacity for medical knowledge has hopefully increased. I'm better with my hands and organizational skills. I can write succinct clinical documentation, perform a deft medical interview, and gather information, but never routinely a sexual history. And perhaps irreversibly, my self-perception has changed. It's damn near impossible to go through the machine of medical education and not develop a deeply rooted, immense respect for the complexity and vulnerability of the human body. And of course, maybe more importantly, a lasting astonishment at its incredible resiliency. But nothing makes you question the beautiful, seamless perceptual abstraction in which we live like working with sick people. I look at myself in the mirror and I think about the fragility of skin and the delicateness of bone. I try to imagine each of the body's systems synchronizing and pulsating together, the kidneys filtering, muscles tensing, the ventricles pumping, and the ions whooshing through my neurons. On the good days, I'm in total awe of the complexity. I'm fascinated by the beauty of the organization, the sophistication of the systems. 
I'm wonderstruck by the abilities we've acquired through modern medicine that allow us to manipulate and alter the function of this intricate syncytium. On the bad days, every little pain could be the beginning of scleroderma. <laughs> I see the beginnings of age and gray hairs and forehead wrinkles, and I find myself envisioning dysfunction, illness, and injury resulting from just about every possible everyday scenario. I reflect on the small blessings, like the ability to remain continent and excrete on command. <laughs> I guess I'm fallible and human after all, but my perception of myself and the world has undoubtedly changed forever. And now we've finally reached the last phase of the cycle, the transition. I know I've felt it these last few weeks, this incredible sense of inertia holding me in place, grasping at the minutes as they tick by like I'm walking through wet cement. I think it may be self-induced. I've pushed back my meetings, been late to every function, and felt unable to accomplish even simple tasks. I'm sure you all can relate. I'm embarrassed that I so lack motivation, but it's more than that. I think it's a reaction to the feeling I get when I think about the last four years. It's what my parents meant when they shook their heads and said, you kids sure grew up fast. It's the blur out the window of the bullet train as it accelerates forward faster and faster with years blipping by like light posts. I find myself trying to hold on on this dizzying ride to draw out each moment a little longer to drink in the sensation of the now. It's not fear of the future or dread of change, but more the love of the simple comfort of the status quo, the serenity of established ritual and routine, the places, the friends, restaurants, streets, running routes, and libraries we've come to know so well. We've all started over before in new places with essentially new lives, and we know we can do it again, but it doesn't make leaving our homes or our routines any easier. Maybe it's just futile rationalization, but I have to take some solace in the fact that we're battle-hardened now. We have scars, hopefully not from a needle stick on a hep C patient. We've collected vitals on 35 patients at 4.45 a.m. We've put in IVs and NGs and Foley's and cut through skin and sewed it back up, given good news, broken bad news, put in orders and written assessments and plans and personal statements. We've gone through some of the most trying times of our lives and learned about our own and each other's strengths and weaknesses, been tested in ways we never imagined. And in addition to all these trials of character, I take comfort that those who came before us have done this, have made this transition time and time again. And so, in looking forward to the next new cycle, new uncertainty, new growth, and new transitions, I'm going to take that fourth year's advice to heart. A little healthy fear of failure goes a long way, but only when coupled with the perspective that keeps us from losing sight of what success really means. You're walking out of here with an advanced degree from a great institution, and by most of society's standards, you could go live under a rock for the rest of existence and still be considered accomplished. But forget that. Success is a more fundamental set of criteria, I think. You're healthy and young, some of you more than others. You have a wonderful intellectual gift and strong motivation to use it to improve our shared experience here on the planet. And better yet, you get to work in an environment that cultivates and encourages critical thought and curiosity, the lifeblood of the human experience. And you get to do all of that while actually helping your fellow humans in pretty fundamental ways. It's an enormous privilege and an enormous responsibility. And anyway, in case you hadn't heard, med school is now pass-fail because it's going to be those intangibles, the stuff our doctoring faculty tried so valiantly to quantify, that's going to save us in the real world. Patients are going to love you because you'll take the time to explain things to them. You'll look them in the eye and ask them about their concerns. You'll go the extra mile to consider their needs. And you'll care about them. Simple. So the next time you run into a stressed out first year, sit him or her down and let him or her know from your heart that it's going to work out. And then take a long look in the mirror 
check for gray hairs, make sure you don't have scleroderma, and then say the same thing to yourself and believe it. It's all going to work out. Thank you. Graduates, please stand. It is traditional that those about to enter the profession of medicine take an oath before their peers, their faculty, and their families, pledging themselves to certain ethical principles of commitment and professional behavior. This particular oath was written by the MD class of 1975 and has been used by each succeeding class. Please repeat after me. Now, being admitted to the high calling of the physician, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the care of the sick, the promotion of health, and the service of humanity. In the spirit of those who have inspired and taught me, I will see constantly to grow in knowledge, understanding, and skill, and will work with my colleagues to promote all that is worthy, worthy in the ancient and honorable profession of medicine. The health and dignity of my patient will ever be my first concern. I will hold in confidence all that my patient relates to me. I will not permit consideration of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, or social standing to come between me and my duty to anyone in need of my services. This pledge I make freely and upon my honor. Please be seated. Sokii honorandi, omenes quos ad gradum magistri, adoneos comperimus, vobis presentamos et eos ad hunc gradum promovere liciat rogamos. 
candidati ad gradum magistri ascendat. Actoritati mihi comise vos ad gradum magistri admito omniaque jura a privilegia ad hunc gradum pertinentia vobus concedo. Quare in testimonium haec diplomata vobus solemniter trado. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipient of the degree of Master of Public Health of Brown University, Kimberly Marie Dickinson. Vedete igator ut probe intergreque in malamentum rei publicae eun dee inorum et decet eos hu gradu honoratos vos geratis. Sedete magistri. Socii honorandi omenes quos ad gradum doctoris medicinae et uneos comparamus vobis presentamos et eos ad hunc gradum promovere liciat rogamos. Candidati ad gradum doctoris medicinae, escendat. Actoritati mihi comise vos ad gradum doctoris medicinae, admito omniaque jura a privilegia ad hunc gradum pertinentia vobis concedo. Quare in testimonium haec diplomata vobis solemniter trado. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Medicine of Brown University. Nina K. Ayala. <laughs> Nishe Ayub. Rahul Banerjee. <laughs> Brian Auchi Bao. Ariel D. Booker. <laughs> Colin William Burke. Christy Marie Butler. <laughs> K. 
Catherine Jean Chamberlain. Jason Wing Hong Chan. Brian Lee Chang. Anna Su Chan. <laughs> Katrina F. Chu. Jack Elliott P.O. Kosman. <laughs> Melissa Marie Cranford. Jessica C. Day. <laughs> Antoinette Shawnee Dawson. Kimberly Marie Dickinson. <laughs> Bryant David Faria. Jude Therese Fleming. <laughs> Libeta Thelma Flores. <laughs> Jane Taylor Gaubatz. <laughs> Rabi Munir Jiha. Matthew Griffin. <laughs> Nachiketha Gupta. Christina Page Guzman. <laughs> Sarah, 
Stephen Winston Hang. Jonathan Hernandez. Zachary Gray Hoffman. Rashid Sayed Hussein. <laughs> Neil Christopher Jackson. Lisa Jacobs. Daniel Sabido Jamarabo. Elizabeth A. Jana Paul Naylor. <laughs> Rosa Hermanina Jimenez. Heather Genevieve Jones. <laughs> Roxana Daniela Juarez. Jenny Ann Jun. Jenna Melanie Kahn. David Junsuk Kim. Julia G. Kim. Michael G. Kim. <laughs> Reggie Kim. Matthew Richard Klein. Yeah, 
Aaron Kaufman. Sheila Krishnan. Shreyas Sanjay Kulkarni. Dennis Hoon Kwan. Farah Lena Laiwala. Alicia Lakani. Kate LaMancuso. Benedict Stefan Landgren Mills. Cameron Elizabeth Walker Lang. Stephanie Twee Tian Lay. Eric Lee. Jenna Catherine Lester. Tony Liu. Jason Jesus Lopez. Madeline K. Mahowald. Alexis Anastasia Mancini. Rachel Marie Morano. Laura Osmond Marcus. Ryan Christopher Mason. <laughs> Laura
Laura Yvonne Mercurio. Samuel Andrew Miller. Jessica Erin Mitchell. John Carlos Molina. Alejandra Navarro. Jennifer Ann Nichol. Sando Besa Ojuku. Melissa Ellen Paulin. David Barth Penn. Laura Ashley Perez. Grace Lorna Price. Arkady Razin. Linda Ratanapra Satporn. Lisa Ratanapra Satporn. <laughs> Ariana Christina Ralphie. Mary Alice Richter. <laughs> Hildred Sarah Roshan. Ralph Rogers. Yeah. 
Jordan Scott Sack. Deepika Sagaram. Zachary Alexander Schwager. May Shen. Peggy Shim. Paul Albert Schultz. Stephen Thomas Straub. <laughs> Joseph Nevers Tofty. Raj Gunsham Vagiani. Mansi Shah Vasconcelos. Jennifer Young. <laughs> Matthew D. Young. Jinyu Zane. Videte igator ut probe inter Greque in emolumentum rei publicae eundei honorem ut decaut eos ut gradu honoratos vos gratis. Sedete doctores medicinae. Socii honorandi, omnes quos ad gradum philosophia, doctoris et uneos comparimus, vobus presentamos et eos ad unc gradum promovere, liciat rogamos. Candidati ad gradum philosophia doctoris ascendat.
Actoritati mihi comisa vos ad gradum philosophia doctoris admito. Omniaque jura a privilegia ad un gradum pertinentia vobus concedo. Quari in testimonium aic diplomata vobus alumniter trado. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy of Brown University. Brian Alchi Bao. Rosa Hermanina Jimenez. Vedete igitor ut probe intergreque in amalumentum rei publicae eun dei anorem, ut decet eos ut grado honoratos vos garatis, sedete doctores in a philosophia. Good afternoon. We are here to present the award for the Medical Senior Citation. We honor you today, Dr. George, with the highest award that we can bestow to acknowledge your unwavering commitment to our clinical and personal development. We are blessed as an institution to have you as a leader and mentor, and we are grateful to you for your unconditional love and support to our class. As our teacher, you taught us about sensitivity as second years, and sinusitis as third years. Regardless of the knowledge level of your audience, you are always an enthusiastic, kind-hearted, and patient teacher. You've worked tirelessly behind the scenes of both our preclinical and clinical educations, coordinating dozens of moving parts and frantic student emails with alacrity and thorough 4 a.m. responses. You have taught us the art of medicine as well as its science, while demonstrating empathy and devotion to your patients that serve as an inspiration to us all. As our ally, your office door was always open. Whether we needed to decompress after a difficult exam, seek advice about future careers or research endeavors, or just wanted to chat about life, you consistently advocated for us as a class to have the best learning environment possible, and you worked to guarantee a meaningful experience during our family medicine clerkship, not because it was your job, but because you cared. You invested in us and recognized us as individuals. You were respectful, humorous, dedicated, and sincere. You are our friend. As our guide, you serve as a role model, clinician educator, Brown Med alumnus, and community leader. You give us the freedom to spread our wings and try out new skills on our own, while never failing to, to provide us the support that we need. During the clinical skills clerkship, you moved beyond just teaching medicine and taught members of our class how to teach medicine, all while simultaneously balancing a busy family life and clinical practice in ways that will never cease to amaze us. You have inspired us all to strive to achieve your level of greatness. 
Dr. George, you truly are, a humble, as, are humble as you are brilliant. But today, as the MD class of 2014 graduates from Brown University, please accept this senior citation as a token of our everlasting appreciation for all that you have done. Thank you for being you. So I'm truly humbled to have the honor to be delivering a closing blessing to this esteemed group of people. I moved to find that the three-part blessing that I chose, three lines from the book um, of Bamidbar, the fourth book of the Bible, of the Torah, numbers in English, uh, this blessing, this, these three parts are very closely paralleled by the words with which Dean Elias opened us. So. The first part of the blessing, which we're actually going to recite together somehow in closing, but I'm going to read them in translation right now and um, interpose them with, uh, with the words of, of Dean Elias. May God bless you and keep you, sometimes translated as protect, but keep you. And uh, in the words of Dean Elias, remember where you came from. May you be kept. May you keep your identity in the midst of all the service that you're going to now go out in the world to do. May the light of God's face shine upon you and bring you grace. His blessing was, may your work put a smile on your face. May you find your passion. May the light of God's face shine upon you and bring you grace. And the third piece is, may God's countenance, or again face, this word panav, be lifted towards you and grant you peace, shalom. The last part of his blessing was to uh, go out and improve medicine, to improve the care that is provided. And truly, I think at the core of this, of all of these blessings, but certainly this last one, to realizing it, is this idea of um, face uh, that we found very much in Dr. Feller's words and in the words that Violet spoke that he quoted about connections mattering and about making sure that you see their faces and that they see yours and that those are real, and that that being the core, that that is the core to realizing these blessings. So this blessing, it's the oldest blessing in the Bible. It's called the priestly benediction. So it was easy for me when they said I needed to deliver a benediction to know this had to be it. It happens to also be in this week's portion, uh, remarkably, not so. And um, the priests, the Kohanim, the high priests used to deliver this blessing by holding up their hands like this. It's where Mr. Spock actually got it from, I kid you not. And um, so the idea was that he was, that blessing, that divine blessing was being funneled through the lattice work of their fingers, of their hands. Because they were not giving the blessing, they were sort of um, an instrument through which blessing flows. And now there's no priestly class actually, because there's no temple anymore standing in Jerusalem. Blessing flows through us all equally. And so I'd actually, I'm going to invite uh, everyone to do, as I recite these blessings in Hebrew and in English, I, I want to invite everyone here. There was one, um, one thing the priests had to have, the Kohanim had to have to deliver this blessing, which was love for the people. If there was somebody present on the day that they were supposed to stand up and bless with whom they had some sort of problem, some sort of beef, they weren't allowed to bless that day because they couldn't with a whole heart and love um, funnel these blessings. So I invite all of those of you here who have love for one of these amazing graduating doctors, I invite you as I invite all of these commencing doctors to please rise. Doctors, please rise. Those who are commencing today. And other doctors in the room and people who love these doctors, please, I invite you to raise your hands. You can go like this or you can just raise your hands. And be sending blessing, whatever that means to you, energy, amazing energy. Your interpretation of these traditional blessings, your interpretation of what you think that these commencing doctors need, send them. Yivarechecha Adonai 
May God bless you and keep you. Ya Adonai panavelacha vichuneka. May the light of God's face shine upon you and bring you grace. Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May God's countenance be lifted toward you and always grant you peace. Amen.